Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, today I want to talk about the German concept of self-cultivation. Uh, I put this here in a presentation. Uh, for those who don't know, I'm an assistant professor at Shandong University. However, uh, this presentation will actually not focus uh, or will not be held in my position as an assistant professor, but it will have a rather informal setting at a friend's bar and we want to talk about what Bildung actually means in Germany and what self-cultivation is. And I think as an example, we can take this kind of lecture or play that the German poet Schiller performed in front of an audience and we can see it happens in a very informal setting. Uh, for those of you who don't know Schiller, he basically wrote the hymn of Europe, uh, the Ode to Joy, which then was, how do you say, instrumentalized by Beethoven in his famous symphony, Ode to Joy. And Schiller performs here while his close friend Goethe, one of the most famous writers of that time, for example, Napoleon, when he came to Jena, I believe, when he took Jena, he didn't want to meet anyone else except for Goethe, who he, wrote, who he thought wrote the most important novel of that time. Now, however, what is important to me here is the very informal setting. We see people rather provisionally sitting in different places. We see little girls, we see people of all ages, and they all feel the very important desire to educate themselves. Although I don't want to say education. So it's a very similar setting to which we will have in that bar, right? Uh, in the bar of a friend. And so why do people want to do that? And is that actually important? Wouldn't it be much better to carry out such a play in a university? Well, and for this, I just want to hint to some numbers, 70, 20, 10. And there was research conducted by uh, Morgan McCall before who claimed that 70% of what we learn is usually learned during our job. 20% is learned through social connections. And only 10% is learned formal education, which is a bit surprising because it means that 90% of what we actually learn is learned informally. Now, are these numbers entirely true? There is some debate about that, of course, in the literature, and it should be rather used as a rule of thumb, but we also cannot deny that a lot of what we really learn is during practical experience and it is due to settings that are rather informal, which drives us to the question, well then, what is education actually? And what is the purpose of educating oneself? And in order to answer that, I think we should first analyze human beings. And I don't want to do it in the Aristotelian sense that I say, well, animals like human beings are animals that learn. And then we have aesthetic understanding of that. Let's try to understand human beings in the evolutionary sense. And of course, this becomes very important today as the learning of humans seems to be superseded by AI. And it seems that we first evolved into a certain kind of cultural entity where we are representing ourselves. And now we are stripping off these cultural elements and are merging with AI, in that sense, is the purpose of education really going further and further to progress until we become the singularity? I think that is a little bit of a simple understanding, and I think it's not a complete understanding of evolution that Darwin actually developed. Now, certainly we can observe that in nature, humans are passively subjected to the forces of its surrounding. And then we have something that even Darwin called survival of the fittest. We know there's like natural selection and natural selection 
consists of a broad variety and then a certain kind of pressure of the environment and then the fittest individuals are actually collected. Now, however, that seems to change at the moment we have cultures and some people claim that humans become suddenly active in evolution. That means to construct evolution themselves. So all these kinds of social Darwinisms that we have seem not to work if we change the environment, if we come to cultures. And that means we have to understand what is actually a culture. And a culture seems to be a surrounding that is replacing what formerly know, was known as nature. Yeah? So culture is our new nature. And human beings are somehow embedded in that kind of culture and protected from whatever is outside. We are not capable of surviving in nature anymore. And therefore, we can say cultures are kind of artificial nests where we are embedded in. And the interesting thing is, if we look in nature, we find actually that animals that build nests, let's call them nesting animals, they tend towards something that is called neoteny. Now, of course, the question is, what is neoteny? And neoteny means that we are not developing the characteristics of an animal that is really fighting against the forces of nature. Rather, we stay in an immature state of being. We see that here with regard to the, uh, to the human head. That basically means that we are keeping the traits that rather babies have. And humans have a rather large head compared to the rest of their body and rather large and infantile eyes. So what does that actually mean? So cultures reward human beings that don't grow up that don't become the fittest animals in nature, but they rather award something that is very agile and flexible, that can adapt and that can learn. So immaturity means that you are still in a state of learning. You are not maturing, you are not becoming an adult. And that means that humans have evolved into animals that are incomplete, that never mature. So, and when, for example, Immanuel Kant asked, what is enlightenment? He said, that's like where we come to maturity. But is that ever the case? Well, if we go into the German tradition, Nietzsche would say, no. There is a danger that we remain these animals, that we don't evolve anymore. But certainly we haven't yet evolved. And that is because... The paradox of man is that now his nature means to not have a nature. Humans have no nature. That, that is part of our culture. Or well, let's say it that way. Our nature is to not have a definite and fixed nature. Others describe that as freedom to become something else. So if people say for humans something is unnatural... That's kind of weird because humans are not exactly their nature. And what do I mean with that? Well, obviously, happiness for an animal is to stimulate its desires. And often we see in the internet this kind of mean, meme. Uh, we see that the dog is entirely situated in its nature as long as its desires are satisfied. And it can just contemplate being while humans, and here depicted in a, in a bad sense, always try to go beyond of their sense. And we see this particular human being, I don't think he can be satisfied because he's mostly interested in things that you can buy with money. And we see he's even interested in money. But is the solution to go back to the animal state where we say happiness it means to stimulate our desires well, I think it's more complicated because the case is that humans don't have a nature. 
And here we see the emergence of the Romantic movement, here expressed in the picture of the German painter Caspar David Friedrich. And I think we can understand that there is suddenly popping up a search in humans, a desire for finding something more, for exploration and finding themselves in that kind of exploration. So now, okay, what do we do if we don't have a fixed nature, if our nature is not to have a nature and move beyond that nature? Well, we have different answers in different cultures. And I think the answer in at least the classical German tradition is self-cultivation, if we can call it that way. It's a translation of the German term of Bildung. And we cannot simply translate that into education. And here, it basically means that happiness for the human and individual means to make yourself an identity. So what does that mean, And becoming an identity? Well, let's think about mothers for a second. So it is well established in sociology that parents usually have a drop in their happiness. As soon as the children are born, the happiness drops. And we can attribute that to stress or many, many other things. And if we said that humans just pursued a normal increase in immediate happiness, like by stimulating their desires, it's certainly not good to get children because they will make you, on a very superficial level, unhappier. Now, why do people decide to still get children? And I claim that is because people want to build identities. And what identity do you get when you get a child? Well, you get the identity of being a mother or being a father, which is a fixed identity, makes you learn new things and gives you orientation. And so this is what I claim, like that identity is usually more important than mere happiness through, let's say, money. And we see that also when we say, I want to be happy. Well, we have to ask, who is I? And I is kind of a cultural product. So in that sense, we can say that learning is the search for healing our existential tornness. It directs us beyond nature towards a self-made identity. And I try to express that here in the picture. Uh, I took this picture many years ago uh, with a friend from China in uh, Pittsburgh. She was a filmmaker. And we sought for, I mean, we were very young. And of course, we tried to express our tornness in a sense. And I think we feel always inside of ourselves that even when our superficial desires are stimulated, that it's not enough. And we kind of imagine a better world, often exemplified by gods. Now, I'm not saying that God exists. I'm not saying that gods don't exist. But I think if we try to think it in an evolutionary perspective, we can say that the command from above that we feel in gods is somehow rooted in ourselves in the way we experience ourselves through evolution as incomplete. Now, just telling everyone I'm not a believer in gods, I'm not a believer in God, but I'm also not a disbeliever. I'm very agnostic about it. So that means I don't know whether God exists or not in a very philosophical attitude. I, I just say I don't know. Now, let's come to the conclusion that I'm drawing here. So our nature is not to have a nature. I call that the incompleteness condition. And learning, in that sense, this is what we figured out, means to confront our incompleteness and to compensate by, for example, building identities. And that is also my conclusion. Learning is a result of our nature, not having a nature and better understood as the building of identities. 
So I think that is maybe how we can translate the German term of Bildung, although not entirely correct. Maybe there's a relationship to building. I haven't checked on that, but I should. And so this is self-cultivation. Yeah, I mean, even when we build identities of a father or a mother, that's not enough. But we have to understand first that happiness for the human animal means to make yourself an identity. Now, in the German tradition, the one, the one who realized that first was Fichte. He, I believe, recognized the incompleteness of human nature as a radical form of freedom. And like his lectures in Germany became so popular because he tended to tell his students, you don't even understand how free you are. I mean, yes, you are subjected to nature. You may be subjected to a certain culture that you are living in. But within this, you can build your own identity. And his idea of university, by the way, was also rather informal. We see again here this kind of informal setting. And we see here in the back uh, probably the gate of Brandenburg that was constructed. So it's very close to the founding of the German university, the first university of the modern type. And why am I saying the modern type? Because you need to know universities were certainly established in the Middle Ages in Europe, in uh, Bologna, for example. But these were universities that were awarding degrees. And most of the students went there to get degrees. And Fichte said, you misunderstand. You are not here to get a degree. You are not here at university to get a degree. You are here in order to build identities in accordance with your society and to move society forward to new grounds. You're not just learning what is old. You are in a kind of moral setting a moral setting that expects from you to grow taller than you are and to realize ideals. And these ideals are dictated by the freedom that you have. So freedom gives you a certain kind of responsibility. Now, the one who realized that in a, in a sense as one of the first was the back then world famous Humboldt, Alexander von Humboldt. He was the founder of the first modern university. He made Fichte. Again, Fichte is this guy here. He made Fichte the first president of this modern university. And the idea was that this university gave you an education of self-cultivation. There were no fixed education schedules. By the way, this is also something that is very surprising to many because when I started studying in Germany, didn't get grades. We didn't get grades. That was later fixed with the kind of Bologna process where they tried to make all European education similar, but we didn't get grades. And many people nowadays, they wonder, like, how can you educate somebody if you don't get grades? Like, but Shakespeare, for example, never received a grade for his plays. He was just writing them. And maybe he was not even writing them for money. He was, in the first instance, writing them because he chose to adopt the identity of an author. Same for a doctor, as Plato would say. So again, self-cultivation here is closely related to an identity. And that was what Humboldt was like. He was not staying in the university. He was going out in the fields, building an identity of a researcher and driving education beyond itself. Now, this idea was also, for example, adopted by Darwin, who was very inspired by... Humboldt's ideas and then decided to join the uh, expedition on the HMS Beagle. And he wanted to be a real researcher. He had a very self-educated background. He was not thriving in school, but his family was one of the most educated families of its time. The Wedgwoods that built highly crafted uh, vases being inspired by the porcelain of China, but also by the ancient motifs. There was a very cultural side in his family, but there was also a very scientific side with, by, his, by his grandfather, Erasmus, who was already developing a certain kind of uh, evolutionary theory. And Darwin, I mean, I can tell you in more detail at another time, 
he actually expanded these ideas by building a new identity, by becoming a researcher, and he was really committed to that. Now, this is basically what we want to say, and here we just have like a summary of what all follows from that. We have the features of this kind of self-cultivation or self-building, and I just made here some remarks. You are probably capable of drawing your own conclusion. So Bildung is a personal question of one's own completeness. Now, if you feel this incompleteness, the question is, how do you fill that kind of gap? So it, Bildung is then closely tied to human nature, but this human nature means to not have a nature. And so it understands humans as radically free of making their own identities. Bildung third means to make oneself an identity as opposed to become merely happy. So I can tell you probably if you just make money, if you just win money in the lottery, uh, there's a lot of research on that. And I was part of an education at the Institute for Happiness that researched that happiness centrally in the world. If you win in the lottery, after about one year, you go back to your natural state. So if you were unhappy before, you will be unhappy again. Now, why are millionaires often happy? Because in our time, millionaires built an identity. And then through that identity, they become happy. Now, does that mean you need to have a lot of money to be happy? No, I claim you need to have a good, well-rounded identity. Another consequence of this is that Bildung is probably never finished as we are always free. And most important, Bildung is informal, self-directed, the realization of projects that make ourselves. Now, let's look at this setting of Bildung as informal again. And by the way, I think YouTube is also such an informal network where people are just contributing. So what does it mean to be an animal that learns? Being an animal that learns means, first of all, to see that you are incomplete in your nature. And for Schiller, who held this play in public, it means basically that you don't have an idea of what you teach people, of what you are going to tell people, what people should do, but that you motivate people to engage in a process of building. And so he very much related it to the idea of place. And by the way, uh, in English as in German, also theater is very often called, or a piece on the stage of a theater is very often called a play, yeah, a play. And he said that the human beings being plays only where they are fully human in the true sense of the word. And they are only fully human where they play. So if I can say again, I don't want to necessarily emphasize the negative aspect of our tornness, but the tornness of ourselves makes us free to make ourselves in place, to adopt characters, to adapt roles, and thereby become another state of human being. So again, the human being plays only where they are fully human. And this is probably what we can also relate to the concept of this bar. So treasure bar is a bar that offers you a lot of opportunities to play. Uh, they have Lanren Shah, they have Juben Shah, and they also want to direct themselves in many other directions of that kind. Oh, so I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just talking about the informal setting here. Uh, that is treasure bar, right? And yeah, I think if, if you want to join that and if you have time to come to China, uh, then just come to treasure and find yourself. Find yourself in the way of how to build an identity. Uh, so yeah, that's basically my presentation that I'm going to give in Treasure Bar tomorrow. And I hope that many people join me and that many people can come to the conclusion that these informal settings are good. Thank you very much. Live long, play, build identities, and prosper.